Seven reasons why you will love typocracy. You guys are gonna love this episode. We're gonna get a little crazy. I'm gonna do something I've never done before. I'm gonna encourage you to make wild, custom, personalized typeface. Stick around. We're gonna get into how to make your own custom fonts. This episode is sponsored by FontSelf. The question you might be thinking to yourself right now is, does the world need another poorly designed typeface? And the answer is a little bit more complicated because normally I would just say outright, no. I've, after all, only recommend a handful of typefaces for people to use. So am I doing an about face just because we're getting paid to do this? Nope, that's not it at all. So my answer is nay B. Navy, and I'll talk about that. Now, the founders of FontSelf, these guys, I'm gonna go into this catalog in a little bit, they're on this mission and they think typography is this untapped self-expressive form of design, of creativity. So they believe that everybody should be able to make their own font as a form of self-expression. So they call it typocracy. It's typography and democracy, Ty typocracy. You guys get it, okay, typocracy. Well, here's the thing. If you were like me, you might be a little reluctant to jump in here for a number of good reasons. I could think of three at least. And the challenges that we face in this is really summed up here from Greg Lindy. He said that the first 90% of the job is great and it's fun. This is true about all creative things, not just designing your own font, but the fun part is the creation and all the possibilities. It's that last 10% where it becomes really tedious. And he's a well-respected, world-renowned font designer, among other things. So the image of the tortoise comes in, where it was fun at the beginning, and now things are starting to slow down and it doesn't get fun anymore. Well, that's about to change. Well, the three challenges that I see that are, one, it's very complex. You're talking about learning new software, uh, dealing with kerning pairs, and just tedious hours, days, weeks worth of drawing letter forms just so you can see something and use it. So back in the day, there were only a handful of programs and they seemed very intimidating. Hence, the reason why I didn't start. And two, as naturally, things that are complex take a lot of time to do. And one of the things that I'm doing today, which takes a lot of time but I'm not aware of, is I have vector drawings of letter forms and I literally copy and paste and arrange them one at a time. So you can imagine if I'm trying to do this at any scale, it's gonna take forever. Again, probably one of the reasons why I use a commercially prepared font. And number three, as we've mentioned, is it's difficult and tedious. It's hours and hours staring at your screen, learning new software that you don't already know how. Well, all of that's gonna change with this software, font self. So here are five reasons that I put together as to why you might want to consider designing your very own font. Okay, here we go. Number one, it's prestigious. You think about world-renowned designers, the thing that seems to separate the average designers from the upper shelf designers is that they've been able to create a font and we know and love and use their fonts and we know their name. In, in some instances, like Helvetica or Futura with Paul Renner, we remember their name for decades after the creation of the typeface itself. That's pretty cool, so it's very prestigious. Two, I've noticed that some design and branding firms actually release a custom version of a typeface that they either had commissioned or drew themselves. They could have modified a commercially available one or just drawn one from scratch, and I'll show you some examples in a little bit. So in a way, being able to say that you design a custom font for your client for their exclusive use, that's pretty cool, don't you think? Three. Rather than cutting and pasting either bitmap or vector graphics together to create a usable word, now you can sit there and create a font in the time that it might take you to arrange one word. You can create the entire font family. You can share it with your coworkers, you can share it with your staff, and you can share it with your clients. Pretty awesome. Four, guess what? In this super hyper-personalized world, if you make your own font and you don't distribute it to the world, which is your choice, you alone have the exclusive use of that typeface that you've designed. That's pretty cool in and of itself. And last but not least, is that I'm gonna mention two people that I know, at least two, who make passive income 
from the fonts that they've created and shared with the world. That's also really cool. So a lot of you guys have seen us talk about creating a passive income business model. Well, if you're a designer, you might sit there and think, what can I do that's of value to the world? Well, here's your answer. So you guys want to stick around for the remainder of this episode because we're going to get into some design theory about what you need to know, just some fundamentals and a little kind of peeking around as I draw three typefaces. Let's see how it goes, okay? Before moving forward, let's start with the masters of typeface design. Max Medinger and Eduard Hoffman, the designers of Helvetica, the most ubiquitous typeface in the world. I love it. And if you're paying attention, you can see that I'm using it right now. So there's no news there. Then there's Giambattista Bodoni, which I also love as a typeface. Victor Lardent, who designed Times New Roman. Paul Renner, Futura. Uh, which is the namesake of this channel. I love Futura so much, I call this company the future, the Futur. Then there's Adrian Frutiger, who designed Frutiger and Avenir, and that's him right there holding um, a type specimen book, I think. And then there's Cloud Garamond, the designer of Garamond. Well, these names you may or may not be familiar with, but if you're really into typefaces and type design, you'll definitely know who the masters are. But we're here in the future, so let's talk about some present day superstars. Um, in no particular order, there's Greg Lindy, who I mentioned, Jonathan Hoffler, who you may or may not have seen on Abstract, the Netflix series, Susanna Licko and Rudy Vanderlands for Emigre, Eric Speakerman, and Tobias Freer Jones. Here are some examples of the typefaces they've designed. Mrs. Eve's, one of my favorite serif typefaces, is designed by Susanna Licko. And I love it for all the little characters that she's created. A classic typeface, beautiful serif typeface. And here's some from Greg Lindy from his, his company, Lux Typo. And look at this typeface that he created called Sudafed Sands. And this was for Johnson & Johnson Company. And it was a way of using a custom typeface for their entire marketing and packaging efforts to keep everything super consistent. I think that's a rad idea. And then Jonathan Hoffler and Tobias Ferrer Jones, uh, they worked on Knockout together. And Tobias is known for also the, the much beloved Gotham typeface, which has been used on so many different branding pieces from Saturday Night Live to the Tribeca Film Festival. Last but not least, there's Eric Speakerman who designed Meta, awesome typeface. Now looking into design firms world renowned that have used custom typefaces, I could think of none better than Michael Beirut and Pentagram. This packaging that he did, and he presented this on stage for nuts.com, I thought was really cool. It's bright, it's fun, it's colorful, it has a very personal feel. And he shared the story about how he took out a brush and started to draw a bunch of these word marks, nuts.com. And then he turned these letter forms into a typeface, which allowed him to create an entire identity and branding package for nuts.com. And according to him, after they started doing this on very eco, friendly materials and adding some personalization with these cute characters, sales skyrocketed. Not convinced yet? I have another example from Michael Beirut for Walk NYC. And here he was really looking for inspiration from his design mentor, Massimo Vignelli, and looked at the subway station signage and these little dots that are synonymous with New York City subway. So what he wanted to do is take the classic cut of Helvetica and change one aspect of it and refashion it as a custom typeface for his client. So here's what he did. He took the tittle, which is that square dot above the eye, and changed it into a circle. These are the clever little things that Michael likes to do to make sure everything is custom and bespoke for his client. So that one round dot is connected to what Massimo Vignelli had done. That's it, that one little dot. Now he renamed it New Helvetica Dot with three weights, regular, medium, and bold, and use it throughout the wayfinding system. And he also went so far as redesigning the icon system to reflect the characteristics of the typeface itself. The skirt of the R matches the leg of the R, the shoulder of the C matches the roundness of the bus, and so on and so forth. The thickness of the tires match the stem of the R. Now, I mentioned earlier, there are a couple of designers that I, I really look up to who do quite well for themselves selling fonts. And Ian Barnard talks about this, that fonts have become his primary source of revenue, of passive income. And he has a bunch of typefaces if you were to go onto the site and check it out. Here are a couple. And then there's 
our good buddy Dustin Lee, who you guys may have recognized as one of the voices behind our episode called Passive Income Business. And Dustin talks about a lot of different things, but for the sake of this conversation, I wanna focus in on fonts in particular. So here are some of the fonts that he offers as part of the Retro Supply Company. This one really caught my eye called Block Print, which is somebody literally cutting out a linoleum block and printing this that give it that super cool feel. Last but not least, there's Sam Parrott, who's used Font Self to design a couple of typefaces, and he too is doing quite well. This one's called Opulent. It has a really beautiful brush stroke look to it. One thing that you notice here is it has transparency, it has grayscale. So now with the use of new font technologies, we can include bitmap images as part of our font, not just vector, and we can also include color. This is really cool. Look at how he's using this typeface. It's called Avalon Open Type and it's an SVG font, which allows you to use color and a bunch of other tricks. So there it is. There's my pitch to you. If you're a designer, if you're interested in design or even just having a bespoke element in your design, give font creation a shot. Okay, so you have no more excuses, but to get started now. All right, this next segment, I'm gonna talk about fundamentals that you need to know, just the basics, so that we have a shared language with what good fonts look like and the anatomy of typefaces. So we'll start off with terminology and anatomy. I typeset this word, typography, and I wanna talk about some of the terms. First up is the baseline. This is where your characters sit on, except for the descenders, and I'll explain what that means in a second. And at the very top is the cap line for the capital letters, and it's hitting the cross bar of the T, and that sits on top of that. And next up is the X height. And the X height is named after the letter X because typically the letter X has flat serifs on the top and bottom. Whereas you'll notice the O overshoots the X height and the baseline. So that's why it's called X height. And lastly is the beard line, sometimes referred to as the descender line. And you think like, why is it called a beard line? And I think it's because typefaces of typeface and a lot of the terms are based on human anatomy and you think of the bottom of the face is the beard and that's what that's sitting on. So that's where the descender of the P is sitting on the beard line. Okay, so now I've colored all the parts that I wanna highlight. And of course, when you dig deeper into this kind of stuff, you'll see conflicting terminology and what people call things. I did the best uh, to my ability to be able to call out things based on cross-checking many things. So let's dive into it. So first up from left to right is the bar of the T. And then right next to that is the beak of the T. It's dipping down, so it's called the beak. And then the vertical stroke, it's called a stem. The bottom of the Y, it's kind of like a cat, so we'll call that a tail, it's wagging its tail. And these little things on the left and the right of the letter P are called serifs, and serif is French, I believe it means feet, so serif, so with feet, it has those things on it. This is called the counter, it's the closed part, that's tr the white area that's trapped, the negative space that's trapped inside the O. On the top of the lowercase g, is called an ear, that the little thing that sticks out. It kind of looks like an ear or a nose, but they call it an ear. And this is a two-story G, and it has the top story and the bottom story. And the thing that connects the top and the bottom is called the link. And of course, the bottom is called the loop. So there's essentially two oval shapes, and what connects them is called the link, and the bottom is called the loop. Now, if you look at the lowercase r, this is referred to as a bracketed serif. There's such a thing as unbracketed and bracketed serif, and I'll talk about what that means in the next slide. So here, as we zoom in, there's two different typefaces here. So one is unbracketed, where the serif has no transition to the stem, whereas the bracketed serif, it transitions, so there's a curved drawing that connects the serif to the stem. Next up is the terminal. It's the dot that finishes at the top of the A. And then you have the belly or the bowl of the A. So it's a bowl and that's what you're looking at. And this little thing on the right side, some typefaces have this part and some do not. So this is called a spur. Some letters do just finish straight up and down and don't curve out like this. It's called a spur. And if you think about the spur of a boot, that's how you can remember that. The stroke uh, that's, uh, that falls below the baseline, that's called the descender. And naturally, the thing that falls above the X height is called the A sender. And the thing that connects the strokes on the H, this little part, is called the shoulder. 
and that's what that is, the shoulder. And that's it for type anatomy and terminology. I'm hoping that now with a little bit more of understanding of what these parts are called, you'll start to become more aware of them as you look at other typefaces. Here's a quick recap, the review with all the terms up on one page. So if you want to, you can screen capture this and just save it for your reference. Next thing I want to talk about is called unity of design. And it's this principle that makes typefaces what they are. All well-designed typefaces display the principle of repetition and variety. So there are things that are the same and some things that are a little bit different. This was what makes it feel like a family, unless you're doing that ransom note kind of typeface, okay? Letters can be clustered into four groups according to the contrasting properties. So here we go. First, letters that have a strong vertical element, like the E-F-H-I-L-N-T. Next are letters that have curved forms primarily, the C, O, the Q, and the S, and they share lots of common attributes with each other. And then we have the ones that have a combination of straight lines and curved. The best example I could think of is the letter D and the letter B as in baby. And then, last but not least, there's the obliques, the ones that have a diagonal line as part of the character. So here it is in review. The four different groupings, the clusters, are vertical, curved, combination, and oblique. Now, if we step in a little bit closer, we can also see that there are commonalities between certain letter forms. And this is a really cool part because once you draw one letter, you can reuse parts of that letter to generate many other letters. So if you draw the D, which is a combination, a vertical and a curved, according to the clusters that we just talked about, you can see there that the bowl of the D, the bowl of the D, is mirrored in the C, the G, the O, and the Q. So it's not as hard as you think to design a typeface. If you just draw one of these letter forms, you can use parts and pieces. So if you're an experienced typeface designer, you already know this, that you keep certain elements separate so that you can cut and paste and move them around, okay? I want to take a moment also now to talk about something that some people miss, which is curved letter forms overshoot the cap line and the baseline. So when you draw the letter O, it's not supposed to sit inside those two grid points. It's supposed to overshoot. It goes above and below those two lines. Next, we see the diagonal strokes of A, B, W, and M also share a lot of common parts. If you look at the letter A and the V, the V is essentially the same as A, but just turned upside down. And it's missing the bar, the crossbar. Again, the W has shared elements with the V, as does the M, okay? Here, the F, the E, and the B in February also share common components. As you can see here, the B, R, K, and P share common elements, as does the A, T, F, and R in the lowercase version of this typeface. Okay, enough of me talking. It's time for us to go and make something. So here's my plan. And if you're paying attention, you can tell this is an SVG font because it actually has color inside. I'm gonna do three different typefaces, three different fonts for you. One, I'm gonna do a hand-drawn one, which I'm gonna do in the studio in just a second. I'm gonna take an existing typeface, I'm gonna modify it and save it so that I can have my own custom version of a typeface. And I'm gonna convert an existing drawing into a usable font, meaning there are vector elements already, so I'm not gonna do this from scratch. It's gonna take a very long time. And I'm gonna show you how easy it is to convert an existing vector drawing into a font that you can use. And that's it, so let's go and draw. I'll see you guys back in a little bit, so hang in there. All right, it's another day and it's another opportunity to make some typefaces, so I brought along with me Two markers, one has a chiseled edge and one has a blunt point. And I think this could actually create something of an interesting look because it's gonna be inconsistent, it could be streaky, and I wanna have some fun with this and I encourage you to do the same. So I'm gonna start off by drawing just a few letters. I've never done this before, so let's see how this works out and let's see what kinds of things I'm gonna learn in the process. I'm just gonna draw the alphabet, right? And I'm gonna draw a few letters to give myself some options later on. That looks pretty good. Draw the B. I'm just gonna do all caps. Some letters are not as interesting to me. I'm not gonna spend too much time drawing those. And once I'm done with this, I'm gonna have Jonah photograph this at high res, and I'm going to convert them into artwork that I can auto trace, or I can keep it 
bitmapped, so it has some of the variations as you'll see because the ink does not dry smoothly. The, the G I'm, I'm struggling with here. Back to vertical letters, simpler. I'm writing this kind of like the way I normally do my whiteboard sessions. So we will have a very usable font that is custom, totally unique to base, based on my own handwriting style, which is really cool because you could do the same. And I have to admit, it's a little less nerve wracking to do this while I'm actually not writing anything and thinking at the same time. Usually when I'm doing the whiteboard sessions, it's hard to write and talk at the same time and spell correctly. And if you're nervous about doing something like this, you can have some practice letters. Forgot where I was. Jonah, what do you think? Do you think you can do this? That is neat. That is neat. I don't think they would want my font. <laughs> well, maybe they really will want your font because it'll be very unique. Now, one thing that I'm not paying attention to, and sometimes this happens when you draw an angle, your letters start going uphill or they start getting bigger on the right side because of the distance. Hopefully that's not happening too much. There we go. So that's one. I forgot, I'm gonna do some numerals right now. So let me do some numbers. And you can even draw alternate characters. For example, the one, I might want to do one like that. I might want to do an alternate to the seven. I think that for the most part, these are pretty good. I'll try to do one where the inside of the six is clear. Okay. Oh, I forgot punctuation. So I'm gonna do a quote, apostrophe, period, Exclamation, let me do that again. Colon, semicolon. What else am I missing? Question? Oh, yeah. What's your question? I'm just kidding. Mm. Uh, minus symbol, plus symbol, divided by short underscore, long underscore. Tilde? Tilde. Surprised you even know what that is. Oh, slashes. Backslash. What about the straight up line? Oh, the divider? Yes. That wasn't very straight. Okay. I think for the most part, we have a pretty complete alphabet. And you guys, now we're gonna take this and I'm gonna jump into the computer and I'll see you then. Now that I finished drawing my letter forms on the whiteboard, I'm gonna jump onto my Macintosh computer here and open up the file in Photoshop, which is what I have right now. Thanks to Jonah, I was able to get a pretty straight, flat photograph of the letter forms. But as you can see here, there's some lighting changes here. You can see that there's a little bit of vignetting. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to adjust the levels. And I can do that by pulling up the levels and then making it go wider in the highlights. But I notice I can't get rid of everything around here. So that's good enough for what I'm trying to do right now. So I'm gonna take the marquee tool select this in preparation. I'm going to hide this for a second. Command Shift I to invert the selection and do the levels again. This time I can really push it far. Oops. What am I doing wrong here? Uh, levels here. Remove the black from it. There we go. Okay, so that's pretty white. Now I'm going to invert that selection again and then do another levels here and see what I can do with this. So I wanna make it darker and in the mid tones and then make it wider elsewhere. And I'm gonna just keep adjusting this until it looks right to me. And that's pretty much it. Now with this, I'm already noticing some problems and perhaps why it wasn't a great idea to draw this on a whiteboard after all. So you can see if I pull some rulers out, I'll do that, if I pull some rulers out, you'll notice that my letter forms aren't sitting on a baseline or on a cap line. This is gonna be problematic for me. I could see also relatively inconsistent letter forms. If I'm gonna create a new layer here, I'll show you what I mean. If 
I draw a box here and color that. So then if I duplicate that down and snap some guides here, let's do it to the baseline here, and pull the guide down right around here, and then pull the cap line here, you can see that this A and the B is much, much bigger than the rest of these letter forms. It's going to cause a problem. I can see that now. And in hindsight, would have probably been better off to draw a baseline and a cap line, even an X height line, um, even though I don't have any lowercase letters here, and then draw that. And this is why it probably makes a lot of sense to be drawing this on tissue paper, aka tracing paper. That way you can draw the lines underneath and then have a clean piece of paper on top. Uh, this is also critical if there is an angle in which you're drawing the letter forms to keep the angles consistent versus it rotating around and not being at a consistent angle. So whatever, live and learn. I'll have to fix this inside of Adobe Illustrator. Okay, I'm going to jump into Adobe Illustrator right now. And I've placed my scanned and cleaned up text in here. And like I said, I could spot some problems. And I'm going to see already I have a lot of stuff to fix in here. But... What I need to do is go and do a live trace on this. And I have mine docked right here, but if you don't know where that is, you go to window and you go to image trace, image trace, and I'll pop up a window. And the window will look just like this. Now the default settings are pretty much what I think I need, which is to do black and white. And I'm gonna click on preview here and it's gonna warn me all this stuff and you're gonna click okay, cause you know what? I live dangerously. So let's say okay. Now if we zoom in here, this is the preview. And if you were to slide the threshold, it'll give you more or less detail. I feel like this is pretty good. If you want to get really into it, you can control the number of pads, uh, the corners, the noise, etc. And I'm pretty good with this, so I'm going to go ahead and convert this now and hit trace. So it should be done. And let's go and do preview. No, oh, it's not done yet. So what I have to do is go to... Um, image trace, where are you? Image trace. It's right here under object. I'm going to image trace. I'm going to expand it. Oh, there we go. Expand. And that's pretty much it. Because it's nice and clean to begin with, I don't have too many things to fix. Now, what I have to do is I have to separate these because there's a white layer and a black layer. I don't understand. But if you ungroup, Command Shift G, I can then delete this part of it. And now I'm left with the clean letters. Now what I have to do is establish a baseline and an X, uh, baseline X height and cap line. So I'm going to go and draw that. Uh, let's say that the letter, let's say the letter B, this letter B looks pretty good. Let me start working with this. Okay. So I'm going to hit Command R, pull out some rulers. I'm going to snap a baseline in there, and I'm also going to zoom in here just to see that. And I'm going to drop in a cap line. And somewhere usually a little bit above the middle, but you know what? I'm going to do a center line. I don't have any lowercase letters to deal with right now. So I'm going to draw a box like that. I forgot to mention, you want to go and turn off snap to pixel. That's going to mess you up. So make sure you turn off snap to pixel. Okay. I can already tell because it was creating some problems for me. Let me grab this and let me fill it with some color. So you guys can clearly see what I'm doing here. I'm going to bring it right next to the B that I think I wanted to use. You can see it's a little bit off. I'm going to just snap it to the guide and then drop another ruler right there. So I know that's the center. And I also have to establish a horizontal width, a stroke. And I'm going to look for something that I think looks pretty good. Let's say the letter I. Oh, no, this E. Let's say that we're going to use this E right here. This E looks pretty good. So I'm going to steal this E for right now. I'm going to move these other B's out of the way. This is off. Okay, bring this E in here. And lo and behold, it is... I have a little extra something here. What is going on? There's some extra stuff. There's some extra stuff I didn't get rid of. Is it still there? Huh. Okay. We have some extra bits here. I'm going to have to clean up. Where are my guides? I need to lock these guides. Okay, getting into this. So delete that. Bring this E down here. And 
I'm going to make sure this sits on the baseline right there. Move it right up. And lock it right there. Okay. Look at that. I got pretty lucky with this um, cap line and baseline, and that's the middle. So what I want to do is establish a vertical stroke width and a horizontal stroke width. So let's say this one seems pre to be pretty consistent. I'm going to bring it up here. I'm going to pull it out so you can see it. Yeah, that's about right. And then I'm going to bring it down here. Feeling pretty good about that. And then I'm going to do one in the middle. I'm going to grab it by the center anchor point and hit that middle line right there. Theoretically, that's the center. And now I can snap some guides here, 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 and right here. This part is pretty tedious, but once we get going, it should be pretty quick. The last thing I want to do is take this and rotate it. Now, you guys should know this if you're paying attention to the programs that we or the videos that we produce, the vertical stroke needs to be thicker than the horizontal stroke. So as reference, I'm going to delete these right now. And we know this is exactly the same. So if I bring it over here, you'll see that it is a little bit thicker. So I'm going to move this over and I'll make it a little bit thicker than that. Okay, let's say that that's a stroke. So I'm going to leave these off to the side so that we have those as reference. Okay. So the vertical stroke is going to be thicker because it needs to be for optical sake. Otherwise, it'll make it feel too thin. Okay, so those are there. We're good to go now. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple other things I need to do, and then we can get really going here. A couple other things I need to do is I need to label this, this guide baseline and this one cap line for font self to recognize it, and that'll be significant later. So I'm going to go into my layers and twirl this thing down and figure out where the heck that thing is. So I'm going to unlock the guides. I'm going to select this one. And let's see, where is it? There it is. It's right here. OK, this is the one we want. This one, we want to call this baseline. OK, and then turn this one on. This one will be called cap line. OK, and that's it. Now I can turn on everything else. That's one critical thing. Took me a little while to figure that out, but later on you'll see why that matters. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move everything off of this area, select all of this stuff, and move it off because I just, oops, I need to lock that back up, which is Command, Option, Semicolon on the Mac. I don't know what it is on the PC. I apologize to you guys that use PCs. Okay, now I can start assembling all letters that I need. So I'm going to grab the B, put it here. So you have some options. This A looks pretty good to me. I'm going to drop it in. I'm not going to worry too much whether they line up or not. I just need to get this thing going. Now, this C has kind of an unusual quirkiness to it that it's not quite as symmetrical as this C, but I think that's OK, because there's no point in me making a typeface that winds up being perfect. Uh, so I can see that I have problems because my letters are all over the place. I need to bring these letters out of the way and see what else is here. Let me get rid of all that. Let me do Command Y to make sure. Okay. Anyways, take these things back. Put them right back here. Okay. And I'm not going to make you guys watch that because that is boring. Um, I'm going to just do this and then we'll jump forward when I have all the characters lined up nice and tight. Okay. A couple of quick notes. A couple of quick notes here. Okay. You want letters that finish sharp, like a horizontal or a sharp vertical, to hit the cap line and the baseline. Whereas you want things that have curves to overshoot, like this one right here, you want it to overshoot the baseline. So you see there's a little bit of a gap difference there. And we want to do the same thing with the top. So I need to take this and I need to bring it up. So it overshoots. Now you'll see I got all kinds of problems here. I need to fix this. So I'm going to use my direct selection tool and move things around. And now you'll find that it's a little bit more difficult to manipulate letter forms like this because there are too many points. I'm going to switch back to my pen tool, get rid of that, and then start drawing this and adjusting it so that it still has the characteristic of the original C that I was looking for, but doesn't have as many points. The points will kill you. It makes it very difficult to adjust the letter form. Right, so you can see that this process is going to take some time. Now, when it went to live trace this thing, image trace it, let me adjust this here. 
you can see that the points here should really be connected like they shouldn't be independent where you can adjust both parts like this the easy way to fix that is use your pen tool and hold down option on the mac and then draw it out like this and then now you see the two handles are connected as they should be because you want this curve to be nice and smooth and transition down there okay and we if we have extra points we just uh, click on top of it, it turns to minus sign and then you can adjust everything else you'll see that it's a lot easier to draw and control so I, I wanted to make that note about the overshoot on the top and the bottom I can see too that some of my letters are leaning left or right or whatever so I want to go and fix that so I'm just going to rotate these a little bit to try and get them kind of straight before I make additional adjustments I can also see that this really should come down farther here so sometimes just tapping on the keyboard will get me there okay I got some problems I'll need to fix here got nothing but problems on this all right I need to move this up and another point to note here is I'm gonna I'm gonna grab the red here and you'll see something that the bowl of the B the the first floor bowl versus the second one it's protrudes beyond this edge and it's supposed to do that otherwise it'll feel top heavy like it wants to fall over but I can see here I got sharp points where I don't want them I want to smooth them out a little bit and throughout this process I'm gonna to have to make a lot of decisions about how perfect do I want this letter form because at some point it'll start to look a little too perfect and lose some of its personality but I also want to observe good proportions and rules in drawing letter form so I don't want to create some kind of bastardized version that just looks terrible when you typeset something okay all right now I can see that this it's not really a serif but it's like where I drew the B from how it went past this I want to retain that so I have to just nudge this up to a kind of like where it needs to be and then I need to fix all this stuff so I think I need to bring this down it's gonna take me a little while to fix all this stuff and smooth this out a little bit uh, maybe it doesn't need this point yeah it's a little easier to control you see how getting rid of points allows you to do that now what I want to do I'm going to get my brush tool here make this a little bit smaller oops how do I make it smaller there we go switch to color switch to color to be something like red I just want to make sure that when I draw it feels like it's connected stroke there so I can tell right now that this is not feeling like that because it feels like it went down so easy way to fix that is just bring this up so it creates that kind of imaginary line across and I can tell here this line is too low and it's going too high so we want to just draw that across like with our eye okay all right and these little things these little nubby things I kind of like now I wanted to line up with that possibly here so I'm gonna bring it over like it's the end of that stroke and I, I overshot that line a little bit okay once we're done we'll create all the 26 characters for the alphabet and then we'll do our numerals and get those all nice and tidy so I'll jump forward to that right now all right we're back inside Illustrator I realized my file got a little bit messy so I cleaned up every single thing and you can see with a lot of tweaking I got this thing to look pretty consistent I'm sure there's still some little funny things here and there but uh, I realized in the last demo I didn't do a good job of drawing the baseline and the cap line for you and it got a little confusing and I figured out a better way to show you that so what you do is create a new layer I'm gonna zoom in here again and I'm gonna do the eye because the eye has the nice straight uh, Sarah for me to work with I'm gonna snap it to that line I want to make sure again good snapped pixels off and then I'm gonna bring this one up here so that's pretty much what the computer needs to see for the cap and baseline so what I'm gonna do now is in here I realized that I need to draw something on this layer there once I have something drawn I can then now twirl this down and see the two guidelines so by double clicking on this let me double check to make sure that's a baseline it is I'm gonna call this baseline cap line and I'm gonna tell you something that you need to do that's critical for this to work cap line boom okay that's done now what I can do is um, delete this whoops delete those two things and unlock the guides which is command option semicolon 
I'm going to grab these two and I'm going to duplicate them while holding down option down here. So let's say it lands right there. Okay, so now I have cap line, baseline, and now I can select all of these things. Um, actually, I think I could just grab this and move that red dot down. So now they all they all need to exist on the same layer for font self to recognize it. So this is how you avoid this, which is too many layers for us to be looking at. Come on, let me move this up out of the way. I'm going to click on a different panel so I can, there we go. Move this up a little bit so you can see. So you see there's too many pads in there, of course. Okay, a couple of the things I want to tell you about and is that each one of these letters needs to be its own object. It's really important that if you had a lowercase i with like an exclamation point like this, that they need to be grouped together. And the easiest way I know how to do that is actually just use a pathfinder and unite them. And there's some options here if you want to look at this. Um, the option that you want to do is, uh, let's see here, Pathfinder options, is you want to remove redundant points. You want to remove the redundant points, okay? So it gives you a nice clean thing. Now some of these drawings have more points than you normally would want, but I'm going to say that it's okay. And if it bothered you, all you have to do is go in here and use the pen tool and click on that and click on anything you want to get rid of. Yeah, there's a lot of extra points there, okay? That's all you would need to do. But I think some of those weird things that when you're drawing, a, trying to draw like a beautiful, perfect font, uh, you, you'll probably need to clean up and make it super optimal. But for the sake of this demo, I think it'll be okay. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my old, oh, what happened to my guides? I think I accidentally deleted it. I'm going to do, get the guides back. There we go. I see they're still stuck on this layer. So I need to grab these two and move them down here. All right, delete that. Okay, now I'm gonna lock the guides, command, option, semicolon, we'll toggle that. I shouldn't be able to select it now, okay. Anyways, what I like to do is zoom out and hide the guides, which is command colon, and just squint and see if there's some inconsistencies or irregularities that I'm still seeing. And, mm, it's not perfect. Like I can tell this part of the O is a little thick on the top. I'm going to zoom in there. I want to fix that. See, so when you see it from far away, for whatever reason, I'm able to see it a little bit better than when I'm zoomed in. That whole zoom in, zoom out thing. Okay. I think that's a little bit better. Now this part's problematic for me. That's because there's not enough points here. I only have three points for a circle and it really needs four. It gives me just enough control to be able to bring that down a little bit. Okay, that looks pretty good. This part looks a little thin here, right? And there's there's no rule as to how perfect or how clean you have to make this. It's entirely up to you. I say depending on your levels of anal retentiveness, you may want to adjust that. All right, let's pretend like this is perfect. And you can work on this for days, months, and years if you want. But for me and for this demo, I think I'm good with this. And now what you do is you're gonna go up to window, you're gonna go to extensions, and you're gonna launch font self right there. This I'm running version 3.5. It's got some new features to it that were just released. Uh, I think I'm gonna be excited about what we're gonna do here. So I'm gonna click on the A to Z. There's a couple different ways you can do this. You can drag it in, and then it'll tell you which one do you want it to be, A to Z characters, etc. I'm not gonna do it that way. I wanna just use this right here. So I'm gonna click this and it'll generate all the uppercase letters. It will respect the baseline that I've created. I can make adjustments here. And if I do this, I, I'm gonna type in the classic sentence. Everybody types in the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dock. If I hit period, I haven't defined the period yet, so that's some weird thing that it's gonna recognize, okay? And what do we see here? I think for the most part, it looks okay. The T looks a little low. I don't know why, or maybe it's the H that looks a little high. Let's push H down a little bit, and I think it would adjust this dynamically. The E is high. Push it down. Make sure it sits. Remember, curved letter forms need to overshoot a little bit. So I'm going to just use my eye right now. Here, I'll create the numbers. So again, I'm going to do this and hit 0 to 9. 
and I think we're good there. Need to make some adjustments again. And I'm going to create the lowercase letters by hitting this since I don't have lowercase letters. Okay. Now that we have that done, we can hit save. And the way that you want to save it is you want to hit the word uh, or the button install. It says for Illustrator use only. Basically, it creates a font that only Illustrator can recognize. And I like that because whiteboard. Okay, and we can select this typeface in a little bit, and we can we can open it up in the browse installation folder and remove it if we need to, uh, but that's okay. I'm gonna close that now. I want to try out the new smart um, kerning function here, so I'm gonna click on this button and hit smart. It's gonna say okay. Go ahead and hit smart space and kern. It's gonna do its best job, and it looks really good already out of the gate. I can see that there's still some problems. I think this is the old T. Uh, it didn't adjust that. So let me type in the new T. It looks pretty good. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy designer. Okay, now if we want to go and make some other adjustments, we can go to advance and look at these kerning pairs and there's quite a lot of them there. Uh, let's type in the, how does that look? That looks pretty good. The new, that also looks pretty good. Darn, okay. Um, so it's it's made all these adjustments for us already, so we don't have to do any of this. So I'm gonna go back home, and I'm gonna hit install, so it'll save it, basically. And when you're ready to export this to be used with other programs, you're going to want to hit save, and it'll create an OTF file for you, and then you can save that anywhere and use it within other programs. But I think I'm kind of done with this, and let's just double check. I'm gonna use this. And let's say we have a new whiteboard session about how to skip school or skip the degree. Let's call that skip the degree. How to avoid living in debt. Okay. So if I hit command T, which will bring up my type panel, I'll type in whiteboard. And I've been working on this, so I think that's the one I need. So I'm going to scale this up. And now you can see it, skip the degree. Now, if you don't like the way that the default kerning works, you can change that. So the way that you do that is you go over here and you increase the line space or the letter spacing. So I'm gonna increase it by just a little bit, open it up a little bit, and I'm gonna decrease the line space by a little bit. And once I hit install, it should update and this should change. Hello, there it goes. Okay. So I can type, oops, copy this again, delete this. There we go. Um, so I want to make it even tighter than that. That feels really open to me. You know, maybe it's like that. Skip the degree, how to avoid living in debt. And that is how you create a custom typeface. Now, the I want to create two more typefaces and show you a little bit. I'm not going to go through the painstaking process of doing this all over again. Yeah. And up next. Okay, there we go. Now I have a custom font that nobody else has. And I think that's a pretty cool thing. So just to make sure, I'm going to go ahead and save this font. Now I'm going to call it whiteboard uh, v dash. Uh, let's call it 01. I'm going to save on the desktop, hit save, and now you can open that up. It has, basically, you can jump in Photoshop, and you can use it, do it, for, do it with it, whatever you want. Okay, that's it for this part. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to convert some other fonts, and I'm going to talk to you about how to do that, and we're going to wrap this up. Okay, so if you're like me, you're able to download different typeface drawings and things like that, but they're not actually official fonts off the stock photography sites, and I have such an example here called Facet. And you see that facet is colored and it has a drop shadow. So it's got some things going on. It even has a stroke on the letter forms and font self can handle all those things. And it's got no problems at all. And one of the things that I noticed too, is that if you hit this hamburger menu on the font self menu and go down to font template, it'll generate this file for you, which shows you the complete characters, which you'll need to build to have a complete and usable alphabet and a typeface, a font, if you will. And I also notice here the naming 
convention here of baseline, descender, X height, cap height, ascender. So I'm gonna use that when I go to name my guides. I'm gonna, don't save on this. I'm gonna go over here, which I've already got a file set up here. It's ready to go. And I've created a cap height and a baseline. And you can see it right here, cap height and baseline right over here. Okay, so I also realize that it has to be unlocked and be selected when you are doing this for it to recognize it. I guess that makes sense. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select all these letters and I'm gonna go over here like before and I'm going to hit A to Z and it'll generate it and it should come in perfectly where everything lines up. Uh, what we'll do is we'll check the S. If the S dips a little bit below the baseline, which I can't really see here, but uh, I think that's gonna be what we need. I'm gonna hit A to Z for the lowercase letters and it'll generate those. And now I have both upper and lowercase. There's no difference here on a font that you draw, you'll probably have upper and lowercase to use. All right, so now that that's done, I can use this typeface. Once I hit the word, uh, the button install, and we're gonna call this facet, hit okay. It's great, it's ready to go. And now I'm gonna test it, and I'm gonna type in some words. The quick brown dog jumps lazy designer. Oh, there's a problem here. Oh, I see. I have my two letters inverted here. Oh, I didn't even see that. You see the M and N here? Those are in the wrong order. So I want to select this letter with this baseline and hit the letter N. And I want to do it for the caps and the, upper, and the lower case. It's gonna, I wanna replace it. And I'm gonna also replace it with the lowercase n and, and hit create glyph. That should take care of it, replace. And I'm gonna select the M with the baseline again. Shift M, create glyph, replace, and lowercase m. Replace. Now I've hit install, it should update it. There we go, it fixed it. So now my spelling is okay. So the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy designer and I wanna make some adjustments here. I wanna open up the letter spacing a little bit because it's such a condensed typeface. Let me type in the same expression over here, copy, paste. All right, uh, over here it looks really open but over there it does not. I'm not sure what's going on. I also want to decrease the line spacing. And then I'm going to hit smart kerning. So smart space and kerning. Adjust all that stuff. And I think we're pretty good now. So if I hit install, it should update this. It'll take a second. Okay. Now it's making the letter spacing really tight for me. It's done a pretty good job, but you can see here in the L and A, it's too tight. So I wanna go back in here and open up the letter spacing now. And hit install and see what happens. Okay, I'm gonna do it a little bit more. Install, there we go. Okay, and you can play with this for as much as you want. Uh, again, this is pretty cool. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I'm gonna test everything, zero. And exclamation, question mark. All the good stuff. It's all working. Okay. Uh, later on, I want to make a semicolon and a bunch of other things, but that's working. So if I want to save this, I want to be able to hit save. I'm going to call it facet and replace the other one. That's fine. Replace it. All good. Okay. I have one more demo to show you and why this is super helpful. I'm sure your, your mind is racing with ideas and possibilities. I'm going to rejoin you in a second. All right, and for this last example, I'm gonna take one of my all-time favorite typefaces, Futura, and those of you guys that have been paying attention to the channel know that that's one of my favorite typefaces. In fact, it is the inspiration behind the name The Future. So there you go. All right, now you know. Okay, anyways, let's just say like you're a big shot and you wanna be able to modify an existing typeface. Well, you can't, currently edit existing commercial typefaces, but what you can do is you can convert them to an outline 
and make modifications to them and then save them out and kind of have your own custom version that you can use. I, I'm not here to answer the legal question of whether or not you can do this or not or whether or not you can distribute it, but I'm going to make the assumption that you can for personal use. And something I've never been fond of are the quotes and the apostrophes from Futura. I just, they're not pretty to me. And it's sometimes hard to tell if they're going forwards or backwards or anything like that. So in this case here, I've borrowed quote marks from a different typeface and I'm gonna use them to replace these. So um, I'm gonna outline this typeface. I'm gonna ungroup this, Command Shift G, and select these and delete them and move those in here. And I think they're gonna look better to me than these. Now, this might be sacrilegious for some of you and for those of you guys that feel like I'm doing some crazy thing here, it'll be okay. We'll all survive, right? You're allowed to do whatever you want. And I'm not hurting anybody, just doing some stuff with type. So as soon as I use this version of the quote marks with Futura, people are gonna notice. People who really pay attention to type will notice like, hey, you did something different there. And uh, I'll never tell. There we go. And you and I, everybody that's watching this video will know the same thing that we know, okay? The whole point is to show you what's possible. A lot of times people get caught up with like, well, I would never do that. That's not, that's not proper. You should never do that. Well, sure, you don't have to, but I will. I notice this goes a little bit above. That. So I'm gonna just create a little line there and bring this one into the same alignment as that make it go a little north of that cap line okay so now i can build my typeface hopefully i was able to type correctly j m o p q r s t u v w x y and z perfect uh, i'm going to create something new get rid of the old one so i'm going to do new font not a new style and i'm going to select these letter forms and i'm going to drop them in just like we've done before okay now we got that and i'm going to do the lowercase letters again it's exactly the same um, I'm going to select these ones here and do 0 to 9. Generate those. Those also work. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm a happy boy right now. I'm going to delete this word quote because I don't need the word quote or don't. And the M. I just need the glyphs that come with it. Delete. Okay. So I'm going to select this. Okay, now that's done, I'm going to hit install. I'll call it FF Futura for the future Futura. There we go. Okay, now all I need to do is to use the type tool and let's give it a try. Let's, let's use a quote and hello world. Let's scale this up. So you guys can see us. This is our typeface. No, that's Gotham. I'm sorry. Let's pull up FF Futura. And there it is. Boom. There we go. How cool is that? Now, we need to fix the kerning here because the kerning looks terrible. And I'm going to go in here and do the smart kerning. And like the letter H, I don't know what that means. I'm going to go ahead and smart kern it. Okay, hit install. It'll update and save this thing and hopefully everything will look a little bit better. Look at that, and it just solved that. Is that cool? Wow. Okay, so just like that, we can have a custom typeface and that's it for this. I'm super excited to see what you guys are gonna come up with and we're gonna review those. All right. As I mentioned to you guys before, this video is sponsored by FontCell, and it's the easiest way to make your own fonts. They have excellent tutorials on their site in both video and blog style format. So I would highly recommend you guys check it out. And here are some of the things that make it so cool. You can convert any shape into a character. You can drag and drop fonts in seconds, and you can create both OTF and SVG type fonts. It runs both on Mac and PC and it has new intelligent kerning tools, which I can't wait to share with you. You can even create custom ligatures and alternate characters, especially if you're working uh, in a language like Spanish where you need alternate characters. 
And like I said, you can create color fonts now, which I'm gonna show you in a little bit. There are two versions that you can buy. And the really cool thing is there's no new tools for you to learn except for the plugin and it's designed in a super simple way. So if you want the Adobe Illustrator version, it's $49. If you want it both for AI and Photoshop for the raster based bitmap images ones, you can use this and it's a combo. So it's 79 bucks. I also wanna showcase some really cool typefaces that other people have designed. Now, since founding this company in 2015, it was kickstarted. There have been now over 300,000 custom fonts made by users. Wow, I guess their mission to make typeface creation and font design easy is coming to fruition. Check out some of these fonts. Wow, that's cool, right? That's neat. Oh man, this one's so cool. Look at this one. Here we are. Now that you've seen me do it and see how easy it is to do, not only is it easy, it looks like a lot of fun. Once I got started, I can't stop. So here's the challenge for you. Design your own custom font. You could do any one of the ones that I talked about or do one on your own. But here's the thing, if you're stuck for an idea, just do your own handwriting. Draw a couple of characters with a Sharpie, make it super easy, scan it in, convert it to vector, and play around with this font creation tool. You're gonna get hooked. That's it. If you like this episode and you wanna see more content like this, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit that bell notification, and see you next time.